asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Now, I know that many of our listeners have been following the Alfie Evans story, and I've mentioned it sporadically in the last um, few weeks, but wasn't able to get anybody from Alfie's family to come on the programme. It's a very difficult uh, story and a very difficult time for them. I, I, I don't understand what they're going through because they don't have children. But the BBC reported late this afternoon that the, the parents of the very seriously ill young boy, Alfie, will be meeting doctors to discuss taking him home. That's according to his father, Tom, who's been addressing journalists outside the hospital where um, he is being cared for. Now, the Court of Appeal upheld a ruling yesterday that said that the boy, who's uh, nearly two years old, that he couldn't travel abroad to Italy after life support was withdrawn. The supporters of the family and the family are very annoyed about that because some of the doctors said that once he came off life support, it would be only a matter of maybe hours before he passed away. But the he's a tough little kid, obviously, because he hasn't passed away and he's battling on. Now, his parents, Tom Evans and Kate James, they wanted Alfie to be transported to, as you know by now, a hospital in Italy, in Rome, in fact, for care. So the parents are now going to meet doctors and they're going to try and get uh, to get him home. He's in the Alder Hay Hospital in Liverpool at the moment. Tom Evans, his dad, said, we got rejected yesterday to go to Italy. Unfortunately, we could take it further, but would that be the right thing to do? Would there be more criticism there? He didn't rule out further legal action and said the family has appeals to explore. The doctors say that because of the extremely um, serious neurological condition he had that he's brain dead now and he should just be left to die. That's what the doctors have been saying all along. Just briefly, here's uh, Jared Tubb. He's a Sky News reporter and he was outside uh, the hospital today and every day. This is the latest from him. Well, that is a very good question. What is going on? We're getting one side of the story. We get the story from uh, Alfie's parents. The only a communication, substantive communication we've had from the hospital is this open letter yesterday uh, in which they reiterated uh, the fact that they are trying to give the best care to everybody uh, and, as you say, pointed out this abuse they've had. But from um, Alfie's parents, we're getting uh, information, some of which um, may, may be not quite what it seems. We don't know that a meeting was scheduled. We don't know that a meeting has taken place. If one has taken place or was ever scheduled, we don't know um, uh, in what form it was. What we do know is that the High Court judge on Tuesday raised the prospect, having thrown out any chance of Alfie being flown to Italy, which is what the parents, backed by these fundamental Christians, uh, wanted. Uh, he said, look, perhaps we could be looking to move Alfie home or to a hospice or to a ward instead of the paediatric intensive care unit because he knows that Alfie's parents have issues about him being on the intensive care unit. They want him to be treated more generally. A, a lawyer, a doctor, sorry, from the hospital who's been treating Alfie said to the judge, look, there would have to be a sea change in the attitude of Alfie's parents before he could leave this hospital because we can't be sure what they would do. Um, so uh, the, the idea that he might leave this hospital really is, is not at all clear. Right, that was Sky News' Jared Tubb. Well, earlier on, I caught up with Anne Widdicombe, an old friend of the programmes, Anne, of course, very well known, former Conservative MP um, and has done a lot of work in the public eye since leaving politics, light entertainment and a lot of stuff besides. Now, I first of all asked Anne, did she support the parents' wishes that um, he should be taken to Italy for further treatment? Anne Widdicombe. Uh, yes, of course they should. Uh, we're not talking here uh, about taking him off to some sort of strange alternative place. We're talking about a world-renowned hospital. We're talking about one that isn't that far away. It's in Europe. There was a military ambulance laid on. The Pope has a helicopter on standby. 
Uh, there'll be medical personnel accompanying him. Uh, and it seems to me that if under those circumstances, parents want to grasp any last small hope, and it may be an extremely small hope, uh, that they should be allowed to do so. Why do you think it is that the judiciary, not to criticise them personally, but those who have sat on that decision and made that decision, why do you think they've been so reticent to allow him go to another European Union country to, you know, to explore that treatment? Why have they been so firm, do you think? Well, of course, we saw this with Charlie Gard, and we also saw it, let us not forget, with Asher King, uh, whereby the very police were turned on uh, to uh, try and trace the parents of Asher King when they took their child to Spain. Uh, And um, they were right. The treatment was a success. The doctors were wrong. The doctors even said that by taking him to Spain, they'd reduced his chances of life. In fact, he, uh, he was cured. Um, And now that same treatment is available to other children in this country, having been proven. They were right. The doctors were wrong. But I think the judiciary always assumes that the medical advice is right. Now, I don't deny for one moment that the medical advice is given uh, in good faith. But there is no guarantee that it is necessarily right. Uh, And whereas I say there is a sensible, world-renowned hospital involved and that's where the parents want to take their child he will get excellent care there what is so superior about older hay that he has to die there rather than in the bambino yezu i i don't disagree with you and i don't pretend to be objective on this particular story i can't pretend to be objective i agree with you Anne. but on saying that those who disagree with you they say the hospital has got links to the Vatican. They've got a, a, you know, they come from a Christian point of view and maybe because of that, because of their identity, they're refusing to accept the UK doctor's assertion that the child is irreparably brain damaged and that any treatment would be unkind and inhumane. What do you say to those who say that this is, you know, this hospital is maybe not being completely objective because of its Christian leanings. What do you say to that? Well, I say that this hospital will try its utmost, where possible, uh, to to treat the child. But there is no doctrine, uh, Christian or otherwise, which says you shall strive officiously to keep alive. We simply say thou shalt not kill, uh, which is a different proposition altogether. Uh, and if uh, the child cannot be treated successfully at the Bambino Yezu, uh, then the decision might well be taken um, that, that he must be allowed to fade away. But while that small hope is there, what I said in the Charlie Gard case, there was no guarantee at all uh, that if he went off to the United States that he was going to be cured, but there was at least a very faint hope there. Uh, and if there's a faint hope, it's understandable that parents want to make the most of that. After all, the doctors weren't expecting uh, little Alfie still to be alive once the life support was withdrawn. But he is. Doctors don't always get it right. That is very interesting, isn't it? And Alfie's father, Tom, has been making that clear in the last couple of days that there was a prediction that the boy would would, would slip away once the uh, care was, once the intensive care treatment, once the life support was removed. But, But he still battling on um god love him so he is the is the children's act then of 1989 and where it says that if the state deems that a child is at risk of harm the state can and should intervene is that a bit black and white that law is it flawed fundamentally I don't think the law itself is flawed. I mean, I think everybody would say, yes, you must put the best interests of the child first. Uh, The problem we've got here is there is a serious dispute about what those best interests are. Now, the doctors at Alder Hay are saying he hasn't got a chance and he should be allowed to die. Uh, And uh, they're saying at the Bambino Yezu, maybe there's a chance. And the parents aren't saying that there is going to be some miracle if they take him to Italy. What they're saying is, there, the doctors are at last willing uh, to explore a chance which he's not going to get at all the hay. Yeah, and you can't not support their right to do that. I can't be, again, I can't say I'm objective. You've got to support their right to, to take him. I mean, he's not going to be distressed 
or upset or uncomfortable on the journey. So why not give the parents that right? And they're meeting with doctors to discuss Alfie coming home. That throws up all manner of questions because if he does go home with his parents and weeks pass by and he's doing, you know, he's he's still alive and he's breathing by himself and, and they can feed him, I suppose at that stage... It, it this will come around again they will say well you know we should now be able if we want to to take him from um from the uk to italy so i don't you know if he's going to survive and if he's going to breathe on his own and he's going to to, to carry on battling this issue of him traveling is not going to go away on is it well of course it's not it does seem to me a very extraordinary position for the doctors to take yeah. to say well the child can go home uh, but he can't go into hospital uh, you know, uh, it's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary position to take. Uh, and the problem is doctors just uh, uh, won't admit that their judgment is not infallible. As I say, we saw it in the Asher King case, clearly demonstrated to be wrong. And yet still they won't admit that they're not infallible. Now, they do owe the courts their best judgment. And I'm sure that everything they have said they believe, but they might pause to consider the number of times that the medical profession has been wrong. There is a huge difference you between mentioned. best judgment and infallibility. And the doctors at Alder Hay nor anywhere else are infallible. Yeah, and you mentioned Charlie Gard. Just before we talk a little bit about the UK and the withdrawal bill and leaving the European Union, not to be mm. putting, certainly not to be putting words in your mouth at all. But do you, do you think, I, I mean, not that you've hinted at it, but maybe there's a little bit of stubbornness. Maybe some in the medical profession might think, well, you know, you, you know I am infallible and I'm not going to, you know, take the risk to send the, or to, to, to consent to the child going overseas. Because if the child um, improves and his condition improves and his quality of life um, returns, well, then I'm going to look bad. So there might be a bit of kind of protectionism there. Is that what we're talking about, maybe? Oh, I'm sure that doctors are always very careful of their reputations, but uh, and, and I think they would be uh, alarmed uh, if they thought that they were going to be shown to be wrong in such a very, very public case. But they were, not these particular doctors, but other doctors were in the case of Asher King. Uh, and doctors have been wrong frequently. Doctors get it wrong almost every day. They get wrong diagnoses. They get wrong prognoses. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean they're not doing their job. It just means they're getting it wrong. Uh, and, and they should acknowledge that the, 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 there is a possibility that in this case that they have it wrong. And as long as the child is going into a hospital with expert care uh, being poured into looking after him, I can't see what the problem is with doctors in this country. It seems to me, it happened in Charlie Gard's case as well, it seems to me they take a position and then they go into a trench behind it. Uh, and they don't actually suggest that the position uh, is there for negotiation. The position is an absolute as far as they're concerned. They start, they need, they talk about a sea change from the point of view of the parents. What we need in this country is a sea change from the point of view of doctors. They owe us nothing more than their best judgment, as I've said. They are not infallible. They shouldn't claim to be infallible. They shouldn't claim uh, that they can actually predict the future. They've already got it wrong with Charlie surviving uh, off life support. They may yet be wrong again, or they may be right. But either way, at least the parents will have had the comfort of knowing uh, that they took every last opportunity uh, to save the child. And at the moment, they can't do that because of our doctors. Well, we wish them the best in the coming days. Obviously, this we is do. developing and we're talking around lunchtime now, you and I. This is going out in the evening, so there might be more yeah. news on that. And I, I voted to leave the European Union. Funnily enough, I voted against the Lisbon Treaty in my native Ireland. Yes. I see the decision taken by the people of this country on June 23rd, 2016. I see it unravelling in front of my eyes. I believe the government is going to be brought down over it. And I believe that Theresa May, under extraordinary pressure, not only from her backbenchers, but from the um, unelected bureaucrats in Brussels, is going to acquiesce to some sort of customs union, which in effect would be a betrayal of that vote. That's my very definite opinion. Are you worried that Brexit is not really going to happen, Anne? I think it will happen, but it, you, where you are absolutely right is that if we stay in the customs union, uh, then we haven't left. 
that that is a betrayal of the vote of the British people. Because if we stay in the customs union, we have to accept EU restrictions on trade, we have to accept EU law, and we have to accept free movement of people. Now, you know, the answer to that has just got to be one huge no. That's not what we voted for. Uh, and uh, Theresa May has just got to face this one down. I mean, I cannot believe that in the last analysis, Conservatives are going to bring down the government uh, in order to put Corbyn in. In order to put Corbyn in? I think in, Brexit yeah. will happen. But it, 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 the course is not going to be a smooth one. We have, obviously, we've seen the House of Lords amending the bill and saying very clearly that the government should be part of some customs union. We know that on our front bench, if you exclude for a minute the Brexit Secretary himself, David Davis, and of course yeah. Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, she is surrounded by Europhiles who want the UK to, first of all, not to leave the European Union, but to have some sort of associate membership or a Brexit in name only. That's where I see serious problems for her. I mean, Jacob rees Mogg in the last day or two, and I would imagine you, you're very supportive of Jacob rees Mogg. His language has become very strong, Anne. Um, the Democratic well, Unionists... Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It, it needs to become very strong, because I think what we've got to do is make abundantly clear to the British people that, you know, this isn't a compromise. If we actually do not leave the customs union full stop, if we compromise on that, then we haven't left the EU. Uh, and that's got to be made abundantly clear. Uh, a compromise is a betrayal when it comes to either the single market or the customs union. Because a, a membership of any type of customs union would would mean that free movement of people would continue yes. as it did. Yes. Are you fed yes, up, and Anne? It would mean we couldn't trade as we want to trade. Uh, without the EU's permission, it would mean being subject still to vast tranches of their law. Uh, it would be quite wrong to do that. So we have simply got to say no uh, and, and stick to that. And Theresa May has to face down the opposition. People who voted for leave, many of them voted on immigration grounds. And sadly, of course, much of the press tried to portray people as bigots or little Englanders when, in fact, you know, many of the people or most of the people I spoke to didn't have any problems with skilled migrants coming to fill genuine shortages, uh, gaps in, in certain skilled sectors in the country. But people were terrified of unskilled or no skilled migrants coming from the European Union, coming over here, making uh, a lot of pressure on public services and all the rest of it. That's the key to it, Anne, isn't it? This, this particular issue. And I wanted to ask you, because we've only got a couple of minutes left, the Windrush scandal, which is a scandal, you know, these, yeah. these people's details shouldn't have been lost. Um, they should, of course, they've paid into the system all their lives. They've lived here as uh, British citizens all their lives. Of course, to me, this is much ado about nothing in terms of they should just um, uh, very quickly sort out the paperwork for these people. But I tell you what I see coming from um, progressives. I see them using this particular issue to go after the notion that people who are not here should not be, um, I, I don't mean hounded, certainly not hounded, but should not be identified and then asked to leave. You get a lot of this from progressives. They're trying to tie this Windrush scandal into, oh, people are always going after the migrants, going after the migrants. I would say no. There are people here illegally who are obviously claiming uh, benefits or, or, or who are dependent on the state. And those people, um, I would say, should not be here. Do you see that kind of conflict there between the Windrush story, which is a genuine, um, you know, kind of, I would say, a kind of a cock up, for want of a better word, and then progressives trying to say, well, this is the government going after migrants, going after migrants, going after migrants. How do you see it? Well, I mean, it's very straightforward in my view. There is a difference between legal and illegal immigration. Uh, and what has happened is that people who were here perfectly lawfully um, have uh, been unable to prove that. But that doesn't mean it was wrong to expect people to prove that they um, are entitled to be in this country. What it means is um, that we got it wrong in a, in a number of cases, and we have to find some means, given that, and it was a Labour government that did it, given that their landing cards have been destroyed, so we haven't got any original documentation, we're going to have to have some means of, of verifying and assisting, and indeed, where necessary, compensating people who were here perfectly lawfully. But what you mustn't do, 
uh, is what I gather Boris has been advocating, which is giving an amnesty, a blanket amnesty to everybody. Because if you do that, you simply encourage people to come here uh, in expectation of the next amnesty. Just finally, do you get fed up? I mean, when the issue of migration comes up and people try to make it, no pun intended, a black or white issue, you know, you're either you know, you know, yeah. a bigot or you're not, when it's far more complex than that, does that vex you? Does that kind of cheese you off? Yes, that, that, that's always vexed me. The instant you propose any sort of immigration control, uh, you're called a racist. Now, if you actually look at what Theresa May said, she said she was creating a hostile environment to illegal immigration, not to all immigration, to illegal immigration. Most of us would agree with that. And because an injustice has been done and some people who were here lawfully, have been caught in the net, uh, uh, who should not have been, because a mistake has been made that doesn't actually invalidate the overall policy of trying to get rid of illegal immigrants. Fair enough. And great to catch up with you again. Thanks for coming back on. I appreciate your time today. And look after yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're to come on the Richie Allen Show for Thursday the 26th of April 2000. And 18. Just before we go, it is a shorter show. It's only an hour today. Uh, a packed hour, though. Uh, we didn't let you down. A packed hour. Just before I go, I want to read this tweet from Mazroth, who says, Richie, my mother suffered from a brain stem stroke in 2005 and eventually died in 2014 after doctors said she had weeks to live. My impression of the neurologists involved was that they knew little about how the brain worked and couldn't answer simple neuro questions. Thanks for that, Mazroth. And Natalie Stacey, how do you Natalie, responded and said, there are too many cases like this worldwide to ignore. That is, cases where doctors say there won't be any quality of life. We expect the patient to die very soon. But in fact, the patient goes on to recover and live maybe for many years thereafter. Thanks very much uh, for that. 